Hi class, back again, and we're talking about chapter nine. So without further ado, I shall share my screen. All right, well, last time we were talking about um, food selection and things like that, we're on to objective three, describing the biological mechanisms of hunger and satiety, net, which means fullness. So hunger and fullness. How do we feel hungry and how do we feel full? So here we go with that. Um, your your stomach fullness activates receptors so just the stomach filling up itself activates a couple of different receptors one is the the, the vagus nerve and the other is the splanchnic nerve and the vagus nerve will convey information about stomach stretching how much the stomach is just stretched out and when the stomach is stretched out that vagus nerve goes off into our brain and makes us say hey wait a minute you're full you've got a lot in your stomach but the splanchnic nerve is also really, really important because it conveys information about nutrients in the stomach. So how many calories have you taken in? It's very different if your stomach is full of chocolate cake than if your stomach is full of salad. So the splanchnic nerve will say, well, the stomach is full, but it doesn't go off because all you ate is a bunch of salad. So you can eat a lot more um, than if you were to eat, for example, a steak or something high in, in uh caloric value. So the stomach, uh, when it gets empty, is going to release a, ho a hormone, and that hormone is called ghrelin. It sounds like a gremlin, and it kind of, I would think of it as it makes your stomach growl like a little gremlin in your stomach, say, feed me, feed me. And so that hormone makes us feel hungry as well, and we're going to see that that is all going to affect the hypothalamus eventually, which uh, get, is kind of the brain's regulatory control over hunger and satiety. Okay, but for still we're talking about the stomach here. Um, here's your stomach, and then there's this area on the top of your small intestine called the duodenum. And the duodenum is uh, an area that is um, going to also release a hormone, and the hormone there is called cholecystokinin, or CCK. You, know, you can just know it by CCK. CCK uh, will cause the, if, you, if, if it starts filling up here and CCK is released, then it will cause this pyloric sphincter to close. And that will make the stomach fill very quickly. And then the vagus nerve will go off and say, hey, you've eaten too much. So these are, again, things in, in the intestine that's gonna make you stop eating. Uh, when you've eaten a lot. So the, the duodenum is also involved through the production of CCK, which is gonna cause the stomach to fill up more rapidly. Okay, let's talk a little bit about blood glucose. You've probably heard about it. Glucose is pretty much fuel for all your nerves and all the cells in your body. And, um, and a, a loss of glucose, though, so you think, well, if I haven't eaten for a while, I don't have any glucose, and all my cells are going to starve. It's not a problem because the liver converts, uh, a, a, it converts glucose into a, a complex carbohydrate, which is a storage, and that's called glycogen, and that stores energy. So that allows you to make more glucose when you're not eating. So say you eat a big breakfast, but then later on, and so glucose is going to be high, right, when your body absorbs that breakfast, um, but then it's going to go down, but that's okay, because some of that breakfast you have put away as glycogen. Some of that extra glucose that you got from that breakfast you put away as glycogen, so you've got some storage there you can hit upon in between meals. Well, there are two pancreatic hormones that become important um, for this whole process. One of them is called insulin. And the ins insulin allows your cells to use glucose. So without insulin, you can have plenty of glucose in the blood and not be using it. And that's what happens in people with diabetes because your, your cells can't get that glucose because you're, you don't have the insulin that allows them to use the glucose. And another thing that insulin does is it allows you to store extra glucose as glycogen. So it's got this dual processes there. And so it basically makes glucose able to be used. Um, there's one more hormone that's important there, and that is called glucagon. 
and glucagon will convert glycogen to glucose. So again, in between meals, you don't have any fresh glucose coming in because you haven't eaten for a while. And so your body is gonna need to get some glucose so that your cells can continue to be nourished. And it's gonna do that by um, using glyc glucagon to convert the stored glycogen to glucose. I know all these words sound the same. We're gonna to try to clarify it in the next slide. Okay, so when you eat, what happens is your glucose goes up because remember, you're at the level of your intestines, all of this uh, glucose is now going into the blood. Then what happens is your insulin starts to increase. Your body starts to produce insulin. In fact, while you're eating or even before you eat, um, anticipating eating will cause uh, insulin to be released. And the insulin is gonna let that glucose into your cells so you, your cells can use them or it will store extra, any excess glucose that your cells don't need, it's gonna store it as glycogen. So that's for later. Now, later on, you have not eaten, uh, or it's a couple hours after you've eaten, and your glucose is gonna to start to go down because you're using up all the glucose in your blood. Your insulin also goes down, and what's going to happen is the glucagon is now going to kick in. You're going to convert glycogen into glucose so your body can have enough glucose. And in, in fact, if you're not diabetic, your blood glucose stays relatively stable because your body is always using that glycogen when, you're, when you don't have the glucose. And that also, that, that um, insulin going down and glucose going down also leads you to feel hungry. So it's also telling your body, to go ahead and eat again. And that's how the process continues, right? Okay, well, what happens to some people is that you get an insulin de uh, dysregulation, meaning that your insulin system does not work very well. And you know this as diabetes. But first, instead of talking about low insulin first, let's talk about a high insulin because that happens as well. So high insulin, a lot of insulin, will cause your cells to keep absorbing glucose. And what happens is they're going to store a lot of it as glycogen. And so you have all of this glycogen. You have a lot of stored energy. Um, what will happen with high insulin like that is that the animal will become hungry because you're, using, you're storing and storing and storing and storing that blood glucose. Now, what happen, when, when this happens um, in the animal kingdom is just before hibernation. And this is how animals get through that hibernation period because they hibernate and they don't eat. And so prior to hibernation, they, put on, they, put, uh, they get all of this stored glucose, which is in, in the form of glycogen. And then they can use that during the hibernation period. What happens when you have low insulin is that you end up with high blood glucose. And much of that gets excreted in urine because it's actually kind of toxic for the body to have a lot of blood glucose. And so remember, if you don't have insulin, your cells can't use the glucose, so it just kind of builds up in the blood. And then you're gonna start peeing a lot of it out. And if you've known someone who's diabetic, um, you'll know that the pee uh, can smell sweet uh, their breath can smell sweet, and that is because they've got a lot of glucose in their blood and they're not able to use it. They will get hungry because their cells are saying, I, I don't have enough glucose, I don't have enough glucose. Truth is, they do, but they just don't have the insulin which allows them to use the glucose. And so there's where we get diabetes. There's a, a video on there to explain a little bit more uh, if you access the PowerPoint. Okay, well, one other thing that leads to uh, hunger and fullness issues, and specifically fullness, is a, a chemical that is produced by fat cells called leptin. And leptin, it, the more fat cells you have, the more leptin you have, basically. And so uh, if you have a lot of fat, your body will basically tell you by having a lot of leptin, that you should you, that you that you're not hungry right because you have a lot of stored energy and so it tends to decrease hum hunger and it in increases immune system and reproductive hormones 
uh, as well. So um, uh, leptin in some ways is, is beneficial for us. One would think that if you have somebody who's obese, you could make a diet pill out of leptin, right? And just give them a bunch of leptin. Well, obese people, the problem is a lot of them have, or most of them have a lot of leptin because they have a lot of fat. Um, but there's a leptin insensitivity that happens among people who are obese. Um, it looks like exercise, one of the reasons why exercise is so effective at losing weight is because it gives you an increased leptin sensitivity. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about some areas of the hypothalamus that are involved in eating. And of course, all of these are completely tied together, and you'll see this. Um, so there are four important areas. One is the lateral hypothalamus, and that is the feeding center. That's what makes us hungry. If you damage it, the animal will basically starve to death. Um, if you stimulate it, it will cause the animal to seek food. And it does that by release of dopamine. And it, and it affects a whole bunch of different things. It affects sensitivity to smell and taste. It, it affects affects salivation, it affects ingestion, your ability to swallow, digestion, your insulin. And so it's a huge regulator, the lateral hypothalamus, regulator of feeding. Then we have the ventromedial and the paraventricular uh, nucleus. And those parts of the hypothalamus, all parts of the hypothalamus, are involved in the feeling of fullness or satiety. A lesion in the ventromedial hypothalamus is slightly different than in the paraventricular nucleus. A lesion in the ventromedial hypothalamus will produce overeating and obesity. Um, it, but, they don't, but, but they don't tend to eat um, very frequently, but they, it, excuse me, they eat very frequently, but they don't tend to eat large meals. So they won't eat very much, but they eat all the time. They don't seem to get, they seem to be hungry all the time. And that has to do with the stomach emptying very fast. So the vagus nerve is, is always, uh, uh, is never activated. And then you get an increase in insulin and increase in fat storage. The paraventricular nucleus also uh, with damage uh, will cause the animal to get fat, but it does so differently. It causes the animal to eat very large meals at a time, and so the animal kind of binges on food. One more area of the hypothalamus that's important is the arcuate nucleus, and it's got both hunger and satiety in it. It's got um, cells that signal satiety and then cells that signal hunger. So let's take the uh, satiety cells first. Um, well, first, let's start with the paraventricular nucleus in the middle of that diagram. The paraventricular nucleus is, will normally inhibit the lateral hypothalamus. Remember, the lateral hypothalamus is all about eating. So if the paraventricular nucleus is stimulated, then it will inhibit eating, and therefore it will uh, 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 tend to uh, cause the animal to stop eating, right? Because the paraventricular nucleus I talked about being about satiety. Okay, well, the arcuate nucleus affects the paraventricular nucleus either by exciting it or inhibiting it. If you excite it, and it, and it does so through a neurotransmitter called melanocortin, it will then excite the paraventricular nucleus, which inhibits the lateral hypothalamus, which causes the animal to feel full. The hunger cells of the arcuate nucleus will inhibit the paraventricular nucleus. If you inhibit the paraventricular nucleus, then you're going to stop the inhibition on the lateral hypothalamus, and then that double inhibition creates excitation on the lateral hypothalamus, which is going to make you actually eat. So on the bottom there, we have a double inhibition. Two minuses make a plus. You get it. So lateral hypothalamus there uh, is causing eating, and this uh, section on the bottom is turning it on. This section on the top is turning it off. Okay, we'll continue with uh, section number four on the next video.